the deposit protection regime? Who pays for that? Will it be the government or the banks? So that's still to be decided, and that's the part of the scheme we're now designing. Most of these schemes around the world rely on a bank levy um, supported by government intervention as required, um, and that bank levy is usually built up over time, over a number of years, hence why you need some government backstop while it's being created. But uh, you know, I think it's really important that this is about tipping the balance in favour of depositors, of the people who banks are there to serve. Uh, we want to make sure they're protected as much as possible, and so the scheme will be designed with that in mind, up against the balance of our banking system that is by and large very safe and secure, but needs to ensure that we have all of the tools in play. No, I mean, as I say, the, the pattern in most countries around the world is that this is funded by a bank levy, um, but as that bank levy is built up, there is sometimes a need for a taxpayer backstop, but that's the, um, what we'll now work through. Mm. So how can you be sure banks won't um, decrease their term deposit rates to cover the cost of the, the levy? Well, we can't be certain about that, obviously, but what we've seen from jurisdictions around the world is that you know these things find a way of washing through the system and you know competitive forces will uh, come to play. But obviously part of the design of the scheme is the way in which we build up uh, such a deposit protection scheme. Um, the length of time we do that, the amount uh, that we settle on is being required. So all of that's still to be worked through and the banks will be important stakeholders in that. And keep in mind it has been viewed favourably by a range of those we've engaged in during consultation and that includes some of the major banks as well. So you've announced today, will they mean that the Reserve Bank needs... We'll go, Jason, then we'll come back to Tova. The moves that you've announced today, does that mean the Reserve Bank needs further funding from the central government or are they just going to have to do more with less? When I was moving quickly through all of the items that we're consulting on, one of them is around the funding of the Reserve Bank. Um, quite clearly, uh, you know, they have a significant role to play in ensuring for New Zealanders that the banking system is not only safe and sound, which it is, but also that the, the behaviour of banks uh, meets the standards that New Zealanders would have. Mm. So I fully expect, as part of that process, um, that the Minister of Finance will be called on to uh, look at what's required, but we'll, we're well uh, some distance away from what that will be. Toba. The Reserve Bank enforcement rules, um, are the penalties available not currently tough enough? Well, that's the debate that we now have to have, is is our regime strong enough? Um, that uh, is both in terms of the level of supervision, the intensity of the supervision, and then, yes, what what might be possible if something is found uh, to be wanting. Clearly when it comes to bank executives per se, we do not have the kind of scheme that Australia has or the UK has. The Australian Bear Scheme is relatively recent. Um, there have been some examples in the UK scheme where I think it was Barclays Bank in, in 2018 where the, there was some uh, uh, fining of, of the chief executive when um, conduct did not meet the standards of their accountability regime. We do not currently have something like that in New Zealand. Have changed the way things played out with the, <clears throat> with the HISCO affair? I'm not going to comment on a specific case in that regard, but what I would say is if you don't have rules like that, it's hard to enforce them, isn't it? Mm. Minister, are you, are you confident that the conduct of the banks has been sufficiently investigated? Mm. Uh, because the ANZ situation mm. for capital and for Mr HISCO happened under its watch, and mm. you're saying you don't need to change much? Yeah, look, um, obviously there is now two Section mm. 95 um, investigations underway, which I hope will shed a little bit more light on how we ended up in the situation we ended up in. Uh, the bank itself um, is obviously with the FMA done the culture and conduct review, and you've seen the outcomes of that today. But what this Phase 2 review does is give us the opportunity to say, is the toolkit fit for purpose? Mm. And that's actually a good opportunity now to use all of the examples that are currently uh, in play at the moment, plus other ones that aren't even necessarily from the, the core banking sector, and to learn the lessons from that. So that's why we're doing the review, and the opportunity there now is, is for us to dig into that. So for the bank capital requirements, um, changes to be published before you actually launch into this, because you've got these two separate things mm -hmm. trying to make banks safer, both of them are going to be piling costs onto consumers. Is there a chance you might be making banks so safe 
that there's that it's not worth the cost that consumers will pay? Clearly, there's an interaction uh, between what we do in terms of depositor protection and what the bank itself does in terms of its capital requirements. But I think you've got to look at the whole picture of what uh, financial safety net looks like, and clearly, you know, that includes both you know protection for depositors how banks remain safe but also the supervision and monitoring regulation how resolution systems work and all of those fit together as a whole in terms of what makes for a safe banking environment I wouldn't say it's crossover I would say that there's actually a relationship between the two and you need to find an appropriate balance but ultimately it's both though I would say are all about trying to prevent a situation where taxpayers pick up the cost when something goes wrong um, and so as has been put to me it's about making sure that you have robust fences at the top of the cliff no is there a chance that with the, the scheme will have a um, an EQC style crown guarantee for when the, the insurance fund runs out and then taxpayers do have to step in because last time you had the scheme the liabilities were in excess mm. of 133 billion dollars yeah it's all about i mean that's all in the design of the scheme but mm. bear in mind in this scheme we're talking about a cap of somewhere between 30 and 50 thousand mm. dollars um that you know we've we've got to make sure that it works with the rest of what makes a financial safety net mm. and i'm confident that we can design a scheme as such that that wouldn't be necessary but that's what we now have to work through hey. after the state there's a, there'll be a state backstop to the scheme the what as i said i'm repeating the answer i gave before but but what we can see from other jurisdictions is that yes it takes some time to build up a levy over time um, and therefore you need some form of, of backstop during that period if we design the scheme well um, I'm confident a bank levy should be able to handle it, but that's what we have to work through. Hamish. Above $50,000 a deposit is certainly on their own. Um, uh, under, the, under the proposed scheme, yes. So yeah. if the bank collapses, you've got more than $50,000, well, you're wiped out. Well, bear in mind we still have open banking resolution in New Zealand, and mm -hmm. so this, this whatever we design for depositor protection would walk al work alongside that for a large bank that was covered by mm -hmm. open banking resolution. So we have to see how the two of those work together. Uh, again, that provides actually potentially quite a, a, a high degree of support uh, for depositors, but for the protection scheme itself, we're talking about a 50k limit, yes. We would be one of the few countries, I think, as I understand it, would, would have world. both a, a depositor protection scheme but also um, the existing regime that we have as well. So that's why working through those details of how the two would interact with each other. Um, but having both actually provides a degree of protection that many other jurisdictions wouldn't have. Would you expect, would, would you, would you expect that the scheme would be fully funded within a certain period of time? Yeah, look, I mean, that's one of the things we now have to work through. But yeah, Yes, that, that, that would be something that we would like to work towards, um, but how we do that, the length of time that that would take um, is something to be debated. But as I say, we're in the process now of designing uh, the scheme. I'm giving you examples of what tends to happen with these schemes around the world, which is that they are based on a bank levy and that over time that is what funds it. But obviously when we do the final detail of the design, we can work out where and how and if a government backstop would be required. Sorry, do we need a Royal Commission into banking here? Do we need a Royal Commission into banking here? Mm -hmm. um, look. No, um, that isn't to say that there haven't been issues and obviously uh, the result of the work that's come out from the FMA and the Reserve Bank, particularly around um, incentives used for the sale of products, um, was something particularly that needed to be addressed and is being now addressed. Tranche 2 does provide us an opportunity though to look at whether or not more tools are required for the Reserve Bank's toolbox, um, particularly when it comes to their uh, monitoring function uh, with bank and bank executives. So we now have the opportunity to rectify that. If we had a Royal Commission, that would simply, I think, prolong a process that we can ultimately undertake with this tranche 2 of uh, work that we're now underway with. It's clear that the FMA and the Reserve Bank whitewashed the activity from last year. They wouldn't even name anyone in their report yeah. and they missed this uh, situation where the country's biggest bank um, gave a three million dollar re rebate or benefit but, to the, to the yeah. wife of the CEO. So, so why, should, why should we have this big reform without a Royal Commission like they had in Australia which actually named and changed it? Yeah, so let's let the Section 95 inquiries mm. take their course and we'll get uh, a lot more clarity about the, the situation with ANZ specifically. But last year, 
what um, we saw was that the Reserve Bank and the FMA undertook their culture and conduct review. They came up with a number of recommendations. They've come back today with the progress on those. Uh, we have to, as, as politicians, I believe, support the regulators in that work. But clearly we remain um, interested and focused on making sure that our regulators have the tools they need. That's what phase two allows us to do. I mean, issues obviously have, you know, I think it's important to point out, issues obviously have been raised, they're in the public domain, and the Reserve Bank are undertaking some work as a result of that. that senior managers have gotten off easy because of a lack of tools to crack down? Well, that's precisely what we're looking at in phase two, is whether or not we need more tools to be able to look at the behaviour, particularly of bank executives. It's not easy because of the lack of tools. Well, I don't know that I'd, I'd characterise it that way. What I'd say is that when we look at other countries around the world, they, um, they clearly have stronger regimes. They have a regime per se. We now um, have the opportunity to look at that. This is why we decided to res review the Reserve Bank Act, mm. was because after 30 years of operation, we believed that we needed to make some changes to make it fit for purpose for the 21st century. We've done that for monetary policy. We now move on to the financial policy and prudential supervision side of the shop. And yes, there are plenty of issues now for us to look at and for us to improve. We could, we could have a royal commission that could take two years and it could tell us you need reform to the reserve um, uh, for the Reserve Bank and greater tools for them to act in these areas, or we could just get on with doing that work. In terms of deposit protection insurance, what was your thinking um, around that potential $50,000 limit? Because my understanding is, is that's lower than um, a whole lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I mean, it, it, it's within the ballpark of, of countries that we would normally compare ourselves to for banking, so in terms of GDP per capita and intensity of banking. Um, it was set largely on the basis of the fact that it did cover 90% of deposit yeah. accounts, clearly significantly less in terms of actual deposit money, mm -hmm. and it gets the balance right between providing protection for everyday bank depositors, but also acknowledging that there is some risk inherent in this. Um, every Everybody always raises the moral hazard argument in this. The reality for governments is that they will end up intervening in one way or another. Um, having this kind of regime means that we have some certainty about that. Um, we, um, everybody involved in the scenario knows how it will play out and um, we give depositors the confidence as well. So do you know what portion of uh, funds deposited that would cover? Because that 90% yeah. of deposits is misleading because I might have three deposits, each worth five or $10,000. Yeah, so uh, I think it covers around about 40% of, of, of actual money, but that balance is the one that you need to strike. Mm -hmm. But for, if you think about it, for most uh, people, what they're worried about in the unlikely event of a bank collapse is the ability to be able to keep paying the mortgage, keep paying the bills. This is set up so that people can do that alongside the fact that you have to have a balance of risk. You said earlier that there was clearly an interaction between the deposit insurance scheme and the bank's capital adequacy uh, proposals. Are you saying effectively that if there's a deposit insurance scheme that therefore the bank may not have to go as hard on the capital adequacy? Well, clearly that's a matter for the bank mm -hmm. um, and the regime that we have is that they make that decision. What I'm saying is that there is a, a, an, a total system of a financial safety net here. That includes regulation, it includes the supervision arrangements, it includes resolution arrangements, <laughs> it includes depositor protection arrangements, and it includes bank liquidity. If you put all of those things together, you have a good solid financial safety net. Clearly they work in sync with one another, and so any decisions about made at either end of that scenario will have to reflect uh, the other end of it.